Hello and welcome to episode number 41 of Chell Squared. I'm your host, Andrew Chelney, and as per usual, we've got a ton to talk about today. Before we get into it here, same spiel every week, but the importance is never lost. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at Chell Squared and on Facebook at Chell Squared for more hot takes, news about future guests, poll questions, and a whole lot more. Please rate the show if you enjoy listening. It means more to me that I can put into words and and every time you either like the show on SoundCloud, give it a rating on iTunes, follow it on Spotify, etc., a puppy gets a hug from its owner. I don't make the rules here, just making sure you are in the know. If you prefer listening to podcasts on YouTube, search Chell Squared Podcast, and the show is there too. The show is everywhere from iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and every other platform you enjoy listening to podcasts on. If Chell Squared isn't on your preferred platform, shoot me a tweet or a DM, and I will put it on there. I'm not sure if this is relevant or important, or whatever, but I figure I put it in here just in case. Better to be safe than sorry. Though I am a serious XM employee, this podcast is not affiliated in any way with the company. The opinions expressed in this podcast are mine and mine alone and do not necessarily reflect the views of Sirius XM. If you're angry at my takes, direct them to me, please, and thank you. This episode is anything and everything related to the Minnesota Wild. The Wild sit four points back of the Avalanche for the final wild card spot. The Avs sit at 83 points. The Coyotes right behind at 81. And the Wild at 79. All three of those teams have five games left to play. The Wild were shut out 1-0 by the Preds in their last game and are 3-6-1 in their last 10. Now they sit in a precarious position where even if they win out and collect all 10 points, they have to heavily rely on both the Avs and the Coyotes dropping games or at least points to have a shot at the postseason. What happened during these last couple weeks that has seen Minnesota go on this skid? The remaining schedule for the Wild Wild is as follows at Vegas at Arizona home against the Jets and the Bruins and the final game is in Dallas against the Stars talk about an uphill battle what is it going to take for the Wild to win all five of these games or at least snag enough points to squeak into the playoffs we'll talk about that for as many ups as the Wild have had this season they've had as many if not more downs what changes have to be made in Minnesota to ensure a better outcome next season how safe is Bruce Boudreaux's job as head coach I said this multiple times on the show. I thought Minnesota should have hired Coach Q when Chicago let him go. I think they could have made the playoffs with him leading the way, but clearly that didn't happen. Is Boudreaux behind the wild bench come October? Is Coach Q maybe Dallas Eakins? I mean, there's a lot of interesting names to be thrown around there. Minnesota also traded Nino Niederreiter to Carolina for Victor Rask a while back. I traded, I hated the second went down for the Wild, and it's only gotten worse since. What's the draft day plan for the Wild? How active will GM Fenton be on his cell phone? And what's the July 1st outlook looking for this team? Minnesota obviously still a great place to play hockey, but will the inconsistency of the organization prevent some players from wanting to play there? How is the future of the Wild looking really, and how set is this team moving forward? How good is the pipeline for this team? Also briefly talk the Drew Doughty comments he made a couple of days ago, and the Sharks responded to. There's a few words to mention about that alter. I guess you could call it an altercation, a story uh, back and forth, whatever, whatever you want to call it. There are some words to be had about that. We'll get into all of that, the poll question, and a whole lot more. Joining me this week is hockey writer for Zone Coverage and Minnesota Hockey Magazine, as well as host of Giles and the Goalie Podcast, Giles Farrell. What's up, Giles? Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on this week. Absolutely. I, I appreciate you taking the time talking some hockey with me. Before we get into the super nitty gritty here, incredibly important question to ask you MLB opening day today a lot of baseball to watch now I've heard opinions on both sides of this argument and I want your take on this in your opinion what's your view on skipping work or school or letting your kids skip school to go to a baseball game on opening day uh well considering 
pretty much I've done that for like the past uh, 10 years or so uh, before I uh, opted not to do that today. I'm uh, I'm wholeheartedly in favor of it. Uh, afternoon baseball is always a, a treat of mine. So uh, taking a day off from work or school is always preferred when it means you get to watch some afternoon baseball. Wow. See, I, I've, I was not raised in a baseball home. So to me, this is very strange, right? I mean, I got in a, I got in a baseball when I was in college. It's, but I've never skipped class or done or skip anything for that matter to either watch on TV or go to a baseball game for opening day. This to me is alien, right? I've, I've heard opinions on both sides, but to me, it's a little crazy, right? Cause it's, it's today's Thursday. And if it was a Friday, I would maybe kind of get it a little bit more. But to me, you know, maybe I'm just the, the old man in this conversation here, but I just don't, I don't understand, right? The, the, the idea of skipping school or work to go to a baseball game. Now, I, I, uh, why do you, why do you do that? Why have you done that for 10 plus years, except for today? Like you said, what's been the, I mean, I get it right. Afternoon baseball opening day. It's, it's great and everything, but you know, you're skipping work or skipping school or skipping whatever it is that you have to do. You're skipping that to go to a baseball game. Why? I mean, I mean, maybe I'm just not understanding the concept of it, but it seems to me that opening day means a lot more to you than it does to me. I mean, I've been a, a pretty big baseball fan for quite a while, so I had it never really kind of given a whole lot of thought to kind of why I you know skip out on these things for opening day. Um, but I don't know. I think for me, I guess it just means that it's kind of a celebration of, hey, summer is right around the corner now. Baseball is starting, warmer weather uh, is upon us and you know a lot of fun times at the at the ballpark are ahead so it's it's always good to kind of even you know during the week take that day off and kind of get into the the spirit of the summer essentially which for me and I'm guessing for quite a few other people is baseball are bosses okay with this I mean again like I'm, I, I'm probably reading a little bit too into this but are are like bosses okay with this are principals okay with this I mean I don't I don't know because I've never done this sort of thing, but I, I would also assume that some people are okay with it. Some people aren't okay with it. And it's a case by case basis, but are, are, do people tend to be okay with, with not coming into work or school on opening day? Well, I've never really said outright that I'm going to a baseball game in my various, uh, skipping of, uh, of work or school. I have, uh, come up with some kind of odd, excuse to not do what I need to do that day. <laughs> the cat's out of the so, bag now, right? Yeah, once uh, once I reveal that I am going to skip out of uh, work now for baseball, I'll, I'll, I'll see what happens, but I haven't uh, crossed that bridge as of yet. <laughs> well, celebration for baseball, at least for today, but for the Minnesota Wild, right, at least in the past couple of weeks, there hasn't been a whole lot of celebration. They are three of six and one their past ten games and are four points behind the Avalanche for the final wild card spot. They've been slipping at the most crucial point of the season where they absolutely can't be, and yet they've dropped seven of their past ten one in overtime slash slash uh, a shootout. What what's the reason behind this skid? What happened? to to this team that has that has seen them go from a potential playoff lock to not even in the playoffs right now. Well, before kind of that um, little streak in the last 10 started, goaltending was a huge problem for the Minnesota Wild. Devin Dubnik was pretty much kind of a train wreck at home, and he had been very good on the road, but his home play was really quite awful. And you look at his splits, and it's it's quite atrocious as to how different he is at home and on the road and now when you get into the last 10 games here for the wild when as you said you know they've won what three out of those last 10 they have had the lights go out offensively where they've only had i think it's in the last nine games they've had eight games they've scored two goals or less in that time they're getting no production 
uh, offensively. And in a game on was that Monday against the Predators, a, a game at home they need to win just to keep in the race. And they lay an egg offensively. Nashville shuts them out one to nothing. And the Wild had chance after chance on Juse Saros to, you know, get at least a goal. They could never bury any of the good chances they had. And really here in the last, you know, couple of weeks, offense has been just a tire fire for the Wild in essence. And that has contributed to their continuing woes here, at least since the calendar turned in 2019. Is there a is there a reason behind their offensive slump? Maybe uh, with Niederreiter leaving to go to Carolina, maybe it's Charlie Coyle. I mean, in your opinion, has there been one specific thing that has led to this offensive donut in a way, or is this a cultivation of a lot of factors combining forces to create this uh, this create this sense of just not being able to score goals? Yeah, there's a lot of different things that's that's going on here. It's not just one uh, one specific thing. You've got, you know, the trade deadline, the Wild had a lot of roster change. You know, Nino Niederreiter, Charlie Coyle, Mikhail Granlin, guys who've all been here five years and more. They're moved out. Ryan Donato, Kevin Fiala, and Victor Rass come in, and now you're putting some unknowns in the lineup where you knew what you were getting with the guys you traded away. And then you put that in with the fact that Eric Stahl is, you know, only scoring half as many goals as he did last year, which was expected. He was going to take a little bit of a step back. And then Jason Zucker is not producing the goals that he was last year. And then you have Matt Dumba, who's been out of the lineup since mid-December. And this guy was on pace to score 31 goals from the blue line. And if you look at Eric Stahl, and his goal production from last year combined with Jason Zucker, those guys accounted for 30% of the Wild's goals last year, and they kind of covered up some warts offensively for Minnesota. You take those guys away, and the Wild offense is a lot like what we're seeing now, where it's pretty dreadful. And so the fact that these guys haven't had great seasons, and then you take Matt Dumba's offense away, and this is really why Minnesota is struggling offensively, because those three pretty much cover up the problems for Minnesota and the fact that they really don't have a game breaking player offensively. They don't have a, you know, a Matthews or McDavid or you know even goal scorers like Panarin out there. They have to work, work, work to get their goals. And when they don't, this is the kind of results you're going to get. The remaining schedule, like I just listed, I mean, it, it really is not an easy remainder uh, for the Minnesota Wild, I mean, Vegas uh, at Vegas at Arizona, home against Winnipeg, home against Boston, and then they go to Dallas to play the Stars for their season finisher. I mean, this is one of the, if not the toughest, last five games out of any team in the league right now, especially for a team that is desperate for points. What what is it going to take for this team? to, if not win all five of these games, at least take the remaining games to overtime, push, push these games to, to the brink of, to the brink of getting as many points as humanly possible. What does this team have to do to ensure that? Well, truthfully, I think it's going to take a miracle um, for the wild to pull 10 out of 10 points here. And you know, even you look at their schedule going into the month of March out of the, the teams that were in the playoff hunt, the Wild had the worst schedule out of all of them. I think their the points percentage of the teams they were playing from March through the end of the year was like 590. They've had an absolute uh, horrid schedule here in March and in April. And couple that with the fact that the Wild really floundered in February when they were playing a lot of the bottom feeder teams in the league and they just floundered around. I don't. I think they went or were slightly below 500 in the month of February, even with you know playing these not great teams. And now they're in a position where they have to win out against teams who are all in the playoff picture and the playoff chase. And it's just so hard to see the Wild pulling five wins out of five to close the season when they are having major issues offensively right now scoring and you know you're playing teams who are really 
fine tuning their game or in, you know, Arizona's case, desperate for wins to make the postseason. And it's just so difficult to see Minnesota pulling that out right now. So this leads me to my poll question, which I tweeted out pretty late, honestly. I I was uh, I tweeted this out as I was coming home from work. I tweeted this out. Uh, what's the likelihood of Minnesota making the playoffs? And I I listed four choices. The four choices were over ninety percent, seventy to ninety percent, fifty to seventy percent, or under fifty percent. Now, Giles, before I tell you which of these four are in the lead right now. Uh, which of these four options would you have chosen? Uh, definitely less than 50%. And if there wasn't even an option for less than 5%, I would have voted on that. As I had, I'm pretty much uh, given the Wild uh, their last rights here, even though there's still uh, five games left to play. That is the option that is in the lead by far. Uh, 67% of people voted for under 50%. 26% voted for 50 to 70%. This poll got over 90 votes, by the way. I'm not sure if I mentioned that or not. Uh, 4% got 70 to 90% of the vote. And I, I guess a, a couple of, of optimistic Wild fans, uh, 3% of the vote said over 90% likelihood that Minnesota is making the playoffs, which, again, I mean, it's possible. Uh, but like you said, and looking at the schedule... <laughs> Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be very, very difficult, if not next to <laughs> impossible. Uh, but you know, the, uh, optimistic wild fans, I mean, I mean, over 90% likelihood, even with the schedule they have remaining, uh, I mean, I don't know if you have anything to, to, to tell them, but uh, they are at the very at at the very least extremely optimistic about the next uh, week or so. Yeah, there's a there's a few optimistic Wild fans out there, but uh, I think you're seeing uh, most of the fan base kind of get settled in and accept life as uh, getting set for the draft lottery, essentially. Which you know you'll find a majority of them are uh, pushing for at this point and maybe hoping to uh, move up some spots in the draft lottery uh, once the season ends. Well, for as many ups as the Wild have had this season, there's been as many, if not more, negatives to this team. In your opinion, what has to be done to ensure a better outcome next season? If you, let's say you're Paul Fenton uh, and in his position right now, what would you do to improve the team so that they are, if nothing else, a playoff lock for next season? Well, I think he he is doing what I have been kind of proclaiming on my podcast uh, for the last year and change is that, you know, he needs to make this team younger and more skilled guys who are maybe going to try and get out there and, you know, shoot the puck. The Wild have a little bit of a reputation for being more of a pass first team and trying to set up more of a perfect play rather than just get the puck on net. And Paul Fenn has kind of done that here in his his moves with Coyle and Granlin for uh, Ryan Donato and Kevin Fiala. You know, guys who are younger, but they maybe have a little bit more certainly youth, um, and they you know maybe provide a little bit more of a shooter's mentality. Um, but Certainly the big thing is uh, getting younger as the Wild, I think, heading into the season. We're the oldest team in the National Hockey League. How would you overall rate the moves that GM Fenton has done recently anyway? The Niederreiter trade, the Coil trade, the Granlin trade. If you were to give an overall grade uh, of all of these moves, what would you give it? I That's a good one. I would probably say... The Niederreiter trade really skews this uh, this grade. But, <laughs> Absolutely, I, that was um, that was not a good not not a good swap. No, and I think if uh, he got a mulligan, he might uh, he might take that one back. But you know, you never know. But I, I gotta say, you know, right now it's kind of a C minus, maybe even D plus kind of area for a grade. As you know, the Niederreiter trade has just been a disaster. As Niederreiter has gone on to do bigger and better things in Carolina, and Victor Rask has been ineffective and injured mainly um, in his time since the trade. Uh, Ryan Donato's actually been a really nice 
uh, trade, that could be a real steal for Paul Fenton. And, you know, that could maybe later change the kind of grade we have from his trades here this season where Donato has 15 points in 17 games with the Wild. And then you have Mikael Granlin for Kevin Fiala, which, you know, early on Kevin Fiala did look uh, look decent. He looked like he had some maybe offensive pizzazz that Granlin wasn't. But really here in the last couple of weeks, we've seen Kevin Fiala really drop off big time. He has been not good in any zone on the ice. And now you're kind of wondering, was this another uh, kind of flawed move that Paul Fenn has made? So it, he's not doing too good on my grading scale as of yet, but I certainly can't blame him for trying to uh, move on from some guys in, in favor of getting more youth in this team. Bruce Boudreaux has never missed the playoffs in a full season that he's coached. This potentially could be the first one. In your opinion, how safe is his job as head coach of the Minnesota Wild? Will he still be behind the bench as next season rolls around? You know, if you had asked me even just a couple of weeks ago, I said it's probably a 50-50 shot that Bruce will be back. But really in the last couple of weeks, you've kind of seen it, you know, maybe slightly hinted at that, you know, this is probably going to be it for Bruce, even if it's not necessarily his fault that you know, the the Wild are, are like this. It it just seems like maybe this team is going to head into a direction that you know you you maybe want a different voice behind the bench to lead the Wild into the next kind of chapter of this franchise. But it will be sad to see Bruce go, as I think it's you know closer to uh, kind of an eighty twenty that uh, that they will move on from him and. As Bruce says, uh, he's always a good quote, and he even hinted at this just this last week that, uh, you know, when he talked about Ryan Donato, how good he's been, and then he hinted that, you know, he won't be here to see just how great Donato is going to be in this league. So that's kind of an indication of where even Bruce thinks his job is at. How would you rate or describe his overall tenure? behind the wild bench i mean the last two seasons the wild have broken over 100 points and yet they went into the playoffs and got bounced in five games both times so overall how would you rate bruce boudreau as wild head coach i think he has really overachieved here and i i really believe that you look at the first two full seasons, the Wild had 106 points. That would have been a fran- that is a franchise record. And then they they would have won the division that season had they not had a complete meltdown by Devin Dubnik in March. And then you know obviously they hit a brick wall in the postseason. That was Jake Allen. And then last season, I really think that was the most you know, overachieving the Wild did, where they still hit 101 points. Um, and they get bounced in the first round of the playoffs by the Jets. And now you've got this season where basically a stale roster comes back for Boudreaux. And, you know, I, I think he's done everything he can to kind of even keep this team where they're at in the chase. And, and so I, it, it's not, it doesn't look great for Bruce, but I certainly think he has, you know, done everything that he can has can in his time here just to keep, uh, you know, the Wild in in the playoffs and keep them competitive. I think a different coach, you might see, you know, very different results because before Bruce came in, the Wild were a very streaky team. They were, you know, they could run off ten wins in a row and then they could lose the next ten. They were very streaky under Mike Yo. Uh, and then, you know, Bruce really ironed that out. That first season, they really didn't have uh, any kind of a, a swoon, essentially. And, and even last year, too, no real losing streaks by the Wild. This year, obviously, a little bit of a different story. But again, this probably had more to do with bringing back a roster that had been largely kept intact for three, four years and no major changes. So it it kind of gets stale, even in the NHL, like, can't bring back the same team or you know even head coaches like three four years in a row you have to have some kind of a change just to keep results coming in let's say bruce boudreau 
after game 82 and let's say the wild don't make the playoffs let's say right after that game fenton announces boudreaux has been relieved of his duties and they are on a search for the new head coach of the minnesota wild who would you prefer to be the new voice behind that bench i've been advocating for for a coach quenville wild marriage ever since they ever since the blackhawks let him go i mean I, I one of his biggest things is location he doesn't want to go too far from chicago which is f- very fair to say he's not 20 years old he's coached every season that he's been in the league uh, ever since his first season um and he's he has family in chicago his life is in chicago it makes sense that he doesn't want to go too far away from chicago minnesota isn't an extreme uh distance from chicago uh i've met my quota for saying chicago i mean like that's that's been what 10 times in like the past 30 seconds that i've said the, the word chicago um but i've said this on the show when it happened and since then that i would i thought that if coach q would have been hired by minnesota Right after he got let go in Chicago, that this team probably would have made the playoffs. I mean, Coach Q it went from a similar situ- would would have went from a similar situation in Chicago to to Minnesota. Though there's no, I guess you could say, franchise players like Chicago has in Patrick Kane and and Jonathan Taves and stuff like that. But they do have a similarly built team that Co- that Coach Q knows how to win with. Um, would they have been contenders? I don't know about that, but I am fairly confident that this team probably would have made the playoffs because they're clearly not very far away from making it. They're only four points out. And with Coach Q behind the bench, I am pretty confident in their ability to to squeak out one, two, three, four extra wins against teams they probably should have won against. In your opinion, which coach... Do you want behind the wild bench? Coach Q, Dallas Eakins, is there maybe a different name? As long as it's not Elaine Vigneault, you do not, you do, coming from a Rangers fan, you do not want Elaine Vigneault behind your bench. That, as, as a complete aside, you do not want AV behind your bench. Who would you want as the new wild coach? Well, there will be uh, probably a fine difference between uh, what uh, maybe I would want and what uh, Paul Fenn probably will go with. Um, but if the Wilds, say, do move on from Boudreaux following the season, this is really probably a great time to be in the market for a head coach again. Um, as you mentioned, you know, Joe Quenville is out there. Uh, Todd McClellan is out there. And, yeah, there's uh, Dallas Eakins as well. Um, there's somebody else I'm forgetting, too. But, uh you know, there's certainly some good uh, picks if uh, you are in the market for a, a head coach. But uh, you know, the uh, the running uh, or the the leading candidate seemingly right now, if uh, Boudreau was let go, would be uh, Dean Evason, who was brought from the Nashville organization with Fenton, um, was their AHL coach uh, for a, a few years before he switched to Minnesota this year and has been. Bruce's assistant. Um, but you know, I, I personally wouldn't want to take him over some more experienced guys, but if Paul Fenn is indeed going to continue his quest to make the wild, you know, more of a younger team, then maybe you need a guy like Everson who, you know, has been dealing with uh, younger players in the AHL for the past few years, um, and kind of lead them into the next chapter of the wild. Would that be your pick? Or if you were Paul Fenton, would you choose somebody else? Well, I probably would. Uh, I probably would pick Everson, but I, I'm not sure if there would be a lot of interest from, uh, from Joel Quinville, even if I did just give him a blank check. Um, you know, maybe uh, you could go after a Todd McClellan who had really good success in San Jose that can't be overlooked and, you know, the blemish on his record is Edmonton, but Edmonton's a blemish on everyone's record at this point. <laughs> and it's very true. And so it 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 could go a lot of different ways, and you, know, you would just see like to see Fenton, you know, do you know his due diligence and making sure he picks the right coach before he just goes with somebody who he's familiar with, which 
also has been a theme with uh, players who he has acquired already this year with guys like Brad Hunt, Anthony Botetto, and of course, Kevin Fiala, all uh, who had had some time with him and the, the Nashville organization. Let's say the Wild stay in this 9-13 to 13 range of death where they're not good enough to make the playoffs and they're not bad enough to tank for a good draft pick. What's the plan looking like for the Wild heading into draft day? Because I would assume that this team is going to be at the very least semi open to the idea of making some moves here. They have some draft picks at their, at their disposal. What, in your opinion, is the most likely situation for the Wild uh, going into draft day? I personally, if the Wild missed the playoffs, then I cannot imagine that uh, Paul Fenn is going to do anything with. Uh, with his higher tiered draft picks, like a you know his first round pick or second round pick, um, you know maybe even he'll try to maybe move somebody and acquire you know another high pick. Um, personally, I think we saw a little bit of last year on day two of the draft what Paul Fenn will probably do draft wise, which is start picking more players with higher upside, kind of boomer bust type picks. Um, they didn't really do that in the first round last year. Um, but I got to believe he's going to start picking, you know, more players with, you know, way higher upside skill wise, because the Wilds blemish you know, in the draft under Chuck Fletcher was they really made more safe draft picks. Um, you know, guys like I don't, Jonas Brody and Jewel Erickson, you know, safe, safe picks, but maybe not the type of players who, you know, you want to try and pick, especially considering you're always drafting in the bottom third. And of course, Jewel Erickson act being the real kind of blemish as you know, five, six picks later after Erickson Eck was taken by the wild, Brock Besser was selected by Vancouver. So, you know, when you're passing on guys like Brock Besser for, you know, Jewel Erickson Eck, who's probably never really going to get higher than, you know, maybe the second line in his career, that is something Paul Fenn's going to have to change. How confident are you in Devin Dubnik as the starting goaltender of the Minnesota Wild? He's 32, going to be 33 uh, at the beginning of May here. 29 wins this season, 27 losses, 6 OT and shootout losses as well. 9-12 save percentage, which is one of the lowest in his career since his, Ed- since his Edmonton days, which I... Uh, which again, like you, like you said a little bit earlier, is a blemish on everybody, right? Is a blemish on Dubnik's career as well. What do you think about Devin Dubnik, and how confident are you in his ability to continue to be a starting goaltender for this team? Yeah, and uh, something else I've been kind of proclaiming about on my my podcast, you know, the last couple of years, not just in the last year, but is for the Wild to maybe spend a little bit extra on getting a decent backup goaltender for Devin Dubnik, as really since Dubnik has been acquired by the Wild, he has played in a ridiculous amount of hockey games. Um, you know, when he first was acquired midseason, that I think it was uh, 2014-15, he yep. played 39 out of the 40 games to close out the season. And really ever since, you know, He's been starting upwards of 60 games per year. And the Wild have never really had a decent backup goaltender to spell him additional nights off. And if the Wild did, say, go out and find a backup goaltender who could spot Dubnik for you know, somewhere closer to 30 games rather than the 15 to 20 that he's getting with current backup Alex Stalock, you know, I would certainly have a lot more confidence in and Dubnik, but the fact that Paul Fenn signed Alex Stalock this, you know, this season, like a month ago, to a three-year extension, you know, doesn't give me a lot of optimism moving forward. And you know, you could see seasons like this where Devin Dubnik just does not look good. And if you don't have confidence in the guy behind him to give him more nights off and win you hockey games, then you know the Wild are really doing themselves a disservice. And 
And so if Dubnik can get a few more nights off sprinkled in, especially as he gets older, I think he can still be a very solid goaltender. I mean, they only have two seasons left with him after this, um, under before he's at UFA. And so I, it'll really be fascinating to see what uh, what the Wild do, if anything, with, with goaltending this summer because you can't think that they're going to keep Alex Stalock as the main backup goaltender. And then if they are, then you know don't. Don't expect great things out of Devin Dubnik in his final two years. I've got a name for you. Now, if Shostorkin comes over from Russia uh, to the New York Rangers, then the Rangers then have three goaltenders. Lundqvist isn't going anywhere. I would assume Shostorkin is the heir apparent. Then that that leaves Alex Georgiev as the odd man out. Now... Uh, I'm not sure if, if you've watched uh, much of him uh, throughout his tenure in New York. His contract is until the end of next season at just under eight hundred thousand dollars. So he's not going to be a a, a uh, an expensive player to get. This guy's good. This guy is very good, and I mean, I don't know how much credit this goes to Benoit Lair, who is a god amongst goaltending coaches in the entire universe and the entire galaxy. Um, but Georgiev is has established himself as a very solid goaltender in this league. I don't know if he's ever going to be a starter or what have you, but from the backup position, he's been. Very solid. He started 26 games for the Rangers this season. He's played 29. Although his stats might not be fantastic, 907 save percentage, 11 wins, 13 losses, three losses in overtime slash shootout. It, it you can't super duper take that face value. I mean, this is the Rangers that we're talking about here. I've unfortunately watched. Uh, the absolute vast majority of minutes that this team has played and the vast majority of of those minutes have been an atrocity, (laughs) especially defending their own zone. I mean, it's been, it's been tough to watch and that is putting it lightly, but Alex Georgiev has held down the fort pretty well, or just as well as you would expect a goaltender to do in that situation. So if Shostorkin were to come over from Russia there it is, because the Rangers would then have three goaltenders, and I would very much assume that Chistorkin is not going to be in Hartford, because apparently that, that situation in Hartford is not great. That team is not doing well, uh, and I, to my knowledge, I would I would believe that he would not go to Hartford, and he would go straight to the NHL. Again, I there's no confirmation of that, so uh, if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. Uh, but I would assume that he would go straight to the NHL, which leaves Georgiev in the middle and stuck between a rock and a hard place. And then I would assume that uh, Rangers would deal him to someone that would want him. In that case, he's yours. I don't know what you would have to give up for him, and I would assume not a whole lot. Uh, but if you want him, and if Shostorkin comes over and you want him, he's yours. Yeah, I mean anything at uh, at this point for uh, for a backup might uh, might do the Wild better than uh, than what they've really gotten out of uh, Alex Stalock, and you know that's not a a sentiment you'll find you know commonly among Wild fans as uh, Stalock is a South Saint Paul native, so they seem to turn a, a blind eye to his uh, his numbers and his production, and they uh, they seem to uh, love him a whole lot more than uh, than myself, but. You know, if you can snag, you know, a guy like uh, you know, Gorgiev, who um, I've I've caught a few games of this year, not not a whole lot, but you know, I am a big uh, Henrik Lundqvist guy. So anytime I get a chance to turn on the Rangers this year, it's just about always been uh, Gorgiev starting, not uh, not Hank. So I have a little bit of a uh, time with with watching him, not uh, not a not a whole lot to, to complain about, but uh, you know, would need a a little bit more of a larger viewing sample size to uh, form a really a whole opinion on him. But if, uh, you know, the wild were certainly to try and uh, snag him and make a, make an upgrade at the backup position, that would be uh, something that might go a long way to, like I said, getting Devin Dubnik back on track next season. If you were to go and watch any game that Georgiev has started, I would very much recommend the game against the Leafs a few days ago on the 23rd. 
45 shots on Georgiev, 44 saves. The Rangers somehow, some way, pull off an overtime win against the Leafs. And some of the saves that he made in that game, I mean, it, it's incredible. Obviously, in the next game uh, against the, the Penguins, he gave up five goals the Rangers lost. Also, he had the least amount of help uh, I've seen in a long time. Uh, and the Rangers just gave up six last night against the Bruins, where Lundqvist had, I mean, it it was honestly like watching an NHL team play a local beer league team. I mean, there was no sort of defense, no sort of lane blocking. It was, I, I think Pasternak, all three of his goals last night were cross crease, one timers. There was no sort of anything going on for the Rangers, except for the couple of goals that they scored. I mean, that this team is, <laughs> this team is a mess. So as, as much as the stats aren't pretty for either goaltender, you really have to take, in, take into consideration this, this blue line, does not exist it literally does not exist um and if washington and or st louis would want kevin shattenkirk back uh i can't drive but i will find a way to bring him to the airport uh <laughs> for uh, uh but for the wild for july 1st now obviously minnesota is still a phenomenal phenomenal place to play hockey at i mean the 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 stadium xl energy center fills the entire stadium for high school hockey if minnesota is a phenomenal place to play this game but is there any sort of concern that free agents might not want to play there because of the kind of inconsistency of this team or the whatever the maybe uh Boudreau leaves and come July 1st there's no real replacement for him yet or is there any sort of fear that come July 1st that players would would prefer to sign elsewhere rather than Minnesota. I mean, I don't, I don't think that that is something that is an issue, you know, as of yet. Again, ultimately, kind of depends on the path the Wild take uh, in the off season. But you know, Craig Leopold is an owner who you know is always willing to to spend to the cap. And if that is something you know Paul Fenn wants to do next year, then. You know, the owner will uh, sign off on that, really no uh, no questions asked. Um, so if the Wild want to go out and target a, a free agent, um, which, uh, you know, if you kind of look at their moves, they've maybe kind of wiggled their way into some cap space to maybe go after a bigger free agent. Um, you know, you, you got to believe that, you know, they would be willing to spend on somebody, you know, if that's the route they are wanting to take. And how is the future of this team looking like if you're the Wild next year, two, three years down the road? What are some of the biggest names that perhaps people not uh, super extremely knowledgeable of the Wild organization are uh, that that should be aware of? What are some of the names that we will hear sooner rather than later playing in a Wild jersey? Well, the big name is uh, Kirill Kaprizov, who uh, really is probably going to kind of hinge the that short-term future of the Wild as, you know, he has one year left under contract in the KHL after this year. And, you know, all signs are he wants to come to the NHL um, following that uh, that season. And he's been really a, a game-breaker over – in Russia, and as we've seen in you know World Juniors and the Olympics, you know he really has thrived on uh, whatever stage he's put on, and really he's the only hope that Minnesota currently has right now for finding that game breaker that they have really been lacking here in the last ten years. Um, so, outside of Kaprizov, the Wild prospect pool is absolutely thin as a. You know, recent draft picks, Luke Cunning, um, Jordan Greenway, um, have been plugged in already to the NHL roster. And then their first round pick just from this past year, um, Philippe Johansson, has uh, not given a whole lot to uh, inspire any kind of uh, confidence in uh, Wild fans for, you know, the future. So the Wild really have to emphasize, you know, draft and development now as, you know, kind of the short term one to three years 
you know, they could have seasons like this still where they're kind of in the playoff hunt because they have, you know, decent talent, but they don't have everything that's needed to push them, you know, on into the playoffs. And while they do that, you know, they could be kind of rebuilding their their prospect pipeline that has really, you know, dried up here in the last couple of years because the Wild have used their higher end draft picks, first and second round picks, for, you know, trade assets at the deadline. You know, I think there was a stretch between 2013 and 20, 2018 draft that Minnesota had only gone through like seven out of 14 of their picks in the first and second round they actually ended up using something something to that effect where if you're only having draft picks 50% of the time in the first and second rounds when you're going to really get those players who are going to make a difference for you then that's going to come back to bite you at some point and that's what we're seeing right now obviously losing Miku Koivu to injury is a big blow to the team and although he he's confident of returning back uh, when he's healthy he's quote totally confident of strong return uh, that he uh, said to uh, a a couple months ago his contract is up at the end of next season how confident are you of Miko Koivu's return next year and possibly beyond I, I would assume judging by his quotes that he is going to return but the question now is how well, is he going to play once he returns? And also, are the Wild going to re-sign him uh, uh, past next season? I would assume so because he is the captain of the team and uh, Minnesota loves Miku Koivu. But how confident are you that Miku Koivu is going to come back as strong as he was prior to the injury? Well, kind of mid, mid-season, I had kind of touched on this topic on my podcast before uh, Koiva went down and you know I was kind of thinking you know because he's up there in age now at 36 he could start doing a thing like we saw with his brother Saku where he just kind of re-signs on a one-year deal every offseason um, if he still feels like coming back and now after this injury which really is a is a big injury to have especially when you are 36 I think what we see from Koivu next year could tell a lot as to if, you know, is this going to be it for him? Um, you know, if he doesn't come back and play it to maybe a level that even he thinks he should be playing at because of that knee injury, then that could be something where he just decides to to hang it up. Um, you know, I'm not sure he overly has a lot of interest in going anywhere else besides Minnesota after that. Um, and if he doesn't uh, kind of, perform up to expectations, then, you know, the Wild will no doubt try to kind of move on as they, you know, have, you know, Jewel Erickson at, you know, trying to keep him up into the top six now. Um, just moving forward, you can't have him buried in the, in the bottom six anymore. So if, if Koivu does come back uh, next year and does not, uh, not look great, then I think that could be an instance where, you know, it's going to end, you know, his wild career and it could very well end his NHL career. And really quickly here, I want to mention the Drew Doughty and Sharks kind of incident conversation. I mean, I don't know how you want to describe it, but uh, a couple of days ago, L.A. defenseman Drew Doughty uh, did not think Brent Burns should be in the conversation for a Norris. He said, and I quote, I watch the games. I watch how they play. I watch Brent Burns get beat 20 times a game, uh, he said via The Athletic. That's how I base it. I like how Mark Giordano plays. I've got tons of respect for Gio. He plays the game the right way. He plays the game at both ends of the ice. He's on the power play. He blocks shots. He's a first PK guy. You don't see that from Burns or Eric Carlson. They're not first PK guys. They're amazing as as offensive guys. None of us are close to them. We don't have the offensive upside, but they don't have even close to our defensive upside. I would want Giordano on my team before those guys. And Brett Burns responded with, I think he's a great player, he told the San Jose Mercury News. Obviously, Giordano is too. Guys can say whatever. Everybody's got their own opinion, I guess. All these guys are guys I'd like to watch and learn from. 
So I would watch his game and learn parts of it. I like my game, though. And Pete DeBoer uh, agreed with Brent Burns, and he said, I just think guys should stick to commenting on their own games. For me, that's where everybody in this league's focus should lie. <laughs> I mean, this is this is interesting. There's a lot of interesting things uh, related to this story. When you first heard about this, what was... What, what what went through your mind? I mean, did you agree with Drew Doughty? Did you, did you think he was totally off base? What did you think? Well, the first thought that kind of crept into my head after I read that was, that is a brutally honest quote that you don't often see from the NHL, so it's a little refreshing to see a player really kind of truthfully give his opinion, especially when it comes to other players around the league. Now, as for exactly what he said, I don't necessarily agree with and also you know credit to Drew Doughty for you know continuing to dump on two guys who he has you know taken Norris trophies away from previously <laughs> uh, so good on him for still putting gas on that fire from years ago but you know I, I think those defensemen like Doughty Burns and Carlson they are you know very good and unique in their own ways and yeah, you might see Brent Burns and Eric Carlson turn the puck over a little bit more, but they make up for that more than on the offensive side of the game, which makes them still a very elite defenseman in this league. So, you know, if Drew Doughty fancies more of a Mark Giordano defenseman on his team, then that's obviously his his opinion. And But, you know, you, you just can't say that, you know, Burns and Carlson are – terrible defenseman because they turn the puck over and that's that's something I've been uh, kind of defending with Minnesota and watching Matt Dumba kind of evolve into what in the defenseman he is now where turnovers were a big problem in his game and wild fans really haven't forgotten that and now you know, Matt Dumba had, was really a bright spot for the wild in an otherwise kind of disastrous season here this year and before that injury, he was really a top-level defenseman who, you know, very well could have been in the Norris category had, you know, he not gone down with, you know, pretty much a season-ending injury in mid-December. Well, one thing's for sure: if if all if all else equals zero here, Drew Doughty not in the top three conversation for Norris this year at at least. Giordano is exceeding all expectations from everybody in the league and then some exponentially. This guy, 35 years old, second in points amongst defensemen with 72. He's also extremely good on defense. Again, I don't I don't have the analytics in front of me right now, so I don't want to base Nora's conversations on points, which is what it shouldn't be, but it unfortunately is. We really should be giving that the Norris trophy is given to the best defenseman, but uh recently it's been given to the defenseman who has a bunch of points, which uh, there's there's positives and negatives too. I mean, you could give the the award to the flashiest player, but is that really the best overall defenseman in the league? I'm not so sure about that. And with that said, because I don't have the analytics, because I don't have the the underlying stats in front of me, I don't want to pinpoint and say I'm giving it to Giordano, I'm giving it to Victor Hedman, I'm giving it to you know insert name player here. Insert player name here, I should say. But I wouldn't give it to Dowdy this season. That's that's probably for sure. Uh, do you have a name in your head that, that kind of sticks out to you and, and kind of says, hey, this is a name that out of everyone that I've seen play this season and out of everything that I've seen overall, I'm giving it to this guy? You know, that's, that's certainly tough. Um, obviously, I... I don't uh, overly have a lot of like for the Calgary Flames, but obviously Mark Giordano is somebody who should very well be in the discussion as uh, um, you know, Drew Doughty kind of brought up. Um, you know, And especially at the age, he's doing what he's doing. At. The guy's just solid in, in all areas of the ice, and you know, putting up 70-plus points is uh, no small feat from the blue line, uh, and again, at that age. And, you know, it, 
really what I what I think it is I'll probably just go to the defenseman with the most points as it you know pretty much kind of does and I I think at some point you kind of have to revisit kind of how we vote on most NHL awards, but that's another topic for another day. But, you know, if I did have to vote, I probably would give it to Giordano just because of what the guy can do in you know all areas, not just offensively and kind of what he's doing in the offensive zone is, uh, you know, kind of a bonus on top of just how good he plays for, for Calgary. I believe the, the Flames – nominated him for the Masterton Trophy as well. If I'm not mistaken, I think I saw that uh, today as the as the full list came out. I'm pretty sure they also gave him the nomination. So that's that in and of itself is very cool. I'm not sure who's going to win that. There's so many different possibilities. Robin Lehner is a big name that sticks out to me. I mean, coming from the the major problems that he had uh, in his personal life to turning that into the absolutely fantastic season he's been having this season has i mean there's there's a lot of names right that you can that you can give the masterton to or at least nominate for the masterton uh when the nhl uh narrows it down to three players but robin leonard definitely definitely has to be one of those three players i think yeah that one i uh haven't done a whole lot of uh research on uh, yet but uh, yeah definitely familiar with uh, Robin Leonard's story so he uh, certainly at the very least should be uh, kind of in the top uh, three if when the uh, NHL has their award show come uh, June. Absolutely now all, again awards are great and everything but obviously the, the main objective here is to win the cup and all that but there's a lot of uh, of great players that deserve at least some sort of you know, some sort of recognition, if nothing else, for a nomination. I mean, I, Giordano is definitely, at at the very least, has to be top three in Norris' conversation. I mean, this guy, man, there's what what can you say about him that hasn't already been said? But Giles, this has been an absolutely incredible conversation. I truly appreciate you taking time away from your day to talk some hockey with me. It means a lot. Plug your social media, plug your podcast, tell people where they can read you and where they can follow you. Yeah, you can uh, find me on Twitter at Giles Ferrell, uh, G-I-L-E-S-F-E-R-R-E-L-L. Um, no uh, underscores or anything like that. Um, and then my podcast, Giles and the Goalie, we record uh, every uh, Sunday or Monday, kind of depending on you know when the Wild play. Um, but uh, available on most uh, you know listening platforms, uh, you know. Also, the big ones, iTunes, SoundCloud, uh, you know, Google Play, all that. And then uh, my written work on the Wild, you can find that at uh, uh, zonecoverage.com slash wild. Um, and then uh, I had been doing some, as you mentioned before, some work uh, kind of in more uh, kind of high school hockey for uh, Minnesota Hockey Magazine. But uh, if you're looking for mainly my work on the Wild, that's again at uh, zonecoverage.com slash wild. Awesome. Again, thank you, Giles, so much. I'll talk to you again real soon. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. And this was episode number 41 of Chill Squared. Episode 42 coming up next week. I'll talk to you then.